Thanks for sticking with us, everybody. We are here on the ESPN Esports Valorant Show. It's Arda, Emily, Tyler, and Jacob. We're going to talk about all things Valorant. If you stuck around for our interview with Hiko and Nitro, thank you very much. If you happen to miss it, it will be available on YouTube. A lot of interesting things said there from the now two members of 100 Thieves. This is the new iteration of 100 Thieves, of course. Uh, what were some of the highlights, Tyler? The thing, uh, the thing that stuck out for me was the fact that they're going to take their sweet time in building this roster and really finding players that match their play styles. Yeah, that didn't really surprise me. So, uh, full disclosure, I'm writing a story about the old Hunter Thieves, the why they broke down, why it didn't work, did they have more potential than they showed. I've been asking and talking to a lot of pros and peers who played them, and pretty much the a lot of like the consensus is they underperformed. Like they believe that if with more time that the uh, the PUBG guys and Hiko would have been a quite a good team. Hiko's internet issues held them back from scrimming as much. But it, at the end of the day, we have to look at it is, is when a hundred thieves came to Valorant, they made an arranged marriage. It was Hiko and four people that the hundred thieves brass thought were very good players with a lot of potential. It wasn't a team that Hiko wanted to create. They didn't dislike each other. It wasn't like a pettiness of everyone in fighting. It was more of just, it was an arranged marriage. And sometimes arranged marriages can work. Arranged marriages sometimes can fall in love and you spend the rest of your life together. This arranged marriage ended kind of awkwardly. It was always kind of a bit awkward and they kind of broke apart. And one of the reasons why Nitro joined 100 Thieves is because he had freedom to make a roster alongside Hiko. So now these two have all the time in the world to make this team because it's okay to fail once. Obviously, when you pick up Nitro, it, it makes everyone forget the failure of the past, but they don't have another mulligan, right? They have to score on this roster. And with this being the last thing this Initial series from a pop flash. They weren't invited to begin with because they're not a partner with uh, the Flashpoint or B Site Inc., or they're not a top team to be invited to it. They now have time to kind of breathe, relax. And I don't think it's going to take, you know, two plus months, three plus months for them to find a starting five. But I do think it's going to take them or it'll give them a month, a month and a half, maybe two months max to find the right players when it's more of a down period of time because what we've heard through sources is that. With the World Championship coming up, the League of Legends World Championship, there will be a lot more. There will be a lot less Riot sponsored events, obviously, since they're going to be pushing World Championship League of Legends stuff full bore for the next month and a half. So it's kind of perfect timing for Under Thieves. I'm very happy they're going to take their time, and I think that while I don't know if it's going to be a full like we can't predict this is going to be a full pro contender team, but I was very interested in, in hearing that Nitro said that other tier one pros of CS, I would believe he's you know, hinting at that, that, that there's other pros currently in the NAC, maybe even Europe, who are looking at Valorant, who are playing a lot of Valorant. And he said some of them hit them up to, you know, see if, you know, maybe they could jump on the 100 Thieves bandwagon mm -hmm. and, and join games because I, we, we, their roster might be players that we would never think of in a million years because they have connections. If there's two players in NA who have connections to the Counter-Strike scene who we would have no, you know, knowledge of who would want to switch over or jump over like the old wcw wwf days <laughs> with the you know who's gonna join the nwo it could be anyone and we've seen a lot of these tier one cs players grinding valorant and it's not just something they play for fun a lot of these guys are you know immortal three or reading level players so it could be a very fun two months ahead of us, Arda. Well, maybe one yeah. of those players is going to be CNED because apparently he just <laughs> parted ways with BBL. I just found it on Twitter. Our chat was telling us about it. Sorry, Emily. I just wanted to interject with that. No, I saw that on the competitive <laughs> subreddit and I actually immediately thought <sighs> to like make a note of it. And I was like, oh, Arda must know oh, his boy. favorite Turkish <laughs> player is free. Oh. No. Um, well, he I plays think, off so... and he plays Jet. Yeah, there you go. Um, mm. I think the big thing that stood out to me from the interview was that Nitro basically said, he's like, I don't even know what agent I want to play. I don't know what gun style I want to go for. I just know that I am an in-game leader, right? And like, that's the role yeah. that I want to have. That really stood out to me because I think um, that's A, just like a really important and also different way uh, and a different approach to roster building than what we've seen thus far from other Valorant teams where we've seen um, either the five stack approach or the pulling a bunch of like, you know, players that have done really, really well in the game thus far or pulling just a bunch of really talented players together from other games. Um, and I feel like if... Uh, 
you know, if they do have time and it sounds like they're being given like several months to put this roster together, it's going to be really interesting to see how the team forms around what they want to do. And the fact that Nitro was really upfront and it's just like, I'm IGL, but, you know, I don't even know what agent I want to play at. I don't even know if I want to op. Like, uh, you know, I might not want to. I might just want to seek out someone else to do that. Um, I think it provides a lot of flexibility depending on what they want to do. And I think it also hints to the fact that they're going to be trying a lot of things before we see, like, the final permutation of their lineup. We might not see those things in front of us because they might not be at tournaments, right? Like, they might not be at major tournaments trying this out. But... That told me that they're really going to focus on how the team works together and they're going to be as flexible as they can be with what Nitro and Hiko already bring and fill in the pieces around how they want to play and their roles, not as specific agents or specific uh, gun styles, but as like in-game leaders and like communicative people. Uh, which again, I just wanted to draw attention to that because I thought it was really insightful and a very uh, interesting indicator of how they're going to be building this roster going forward. So I have a couple of thoughts there because uh, Perenegade in our chat said something about um, Nitro, like it asked if it was a red flag that Nitro doesn't even know what agent he's playing. So, and and whether like Hunter T is taking this risk just because he was really good at Counter-Strike and a great in-game leader. I think that's partly true, actually, because I interviewed him extensively a couple weeks ago for a feature I did about him leaving Counter-Strike. And he basically told me like, he had been playing at that point, which was about a week and a half ago, had only been playing Valorant for about two weeks, two and a half weeks. And so, like, seriously, like, he had played when it first came out. If you remember, Team Liquid did some show matches, but he really put it to the side to, like, finish out on, a, uh, like, try to finish out Counter-Strike on a high note and really focus on Counter-Strike. He said Valorant was kind of distracting to him at first. Um, so, yeah, I do think that they're taking a little bit of a risk on him. He is, uh, you know, and look, like, in-game leaders don't need to be the most individually skilled. I think Nitro, if you've seen anything about him in Counter-Strike, he's actually very good at, like, being clutch. That's one thing that a lot of people praise him for is that he's really good in really high-pressure high moments, which is why I think he'll be a good land player in Valorant. But yeah, I do think that there is a little bit of this. He's good at Counter-Strike and he's very vocal. Um, and I think that they need that. Uh, I, and, you know, that doesn't necessarily correlate to like being the best like Valorant player right now as much as it does like watching your opponent teams, taking notes, being able to like call it, uh, strategies against them and like really being that voice. I think Hiko was that voice on high ground and like Hiko was IGL before in CS and he's fine at it, but like I think a Nitro is generally a better in-game leader than than Hiko. So I think that bringing in Nitro and building this roster with them uh, will be better for the long term. Uh, breaking news: uh, CNED just DM'd me actually, uh, okay. and he told me he said, uh, "I said what happened." He said, uh, I, "We couldn't come to a, a terms of agreement on our contract. I'm the only one, so the rest of the BBL did come to terms. He's looking for team." And I said, "What about Hundred Thieves?" He said, "I don't know. If I get an offer, why not? Maybe I'll reach no. out." <laughs> there Obviously, you go. Obviously, he'd have to move, well, and it would be a lot well, more to talk like, about there. I but... like how you've already cornered the market uh, on the Turkish the Turkey Valorant scene. Yeah. I really appreciate that, actually. <laughs> I got you, Valorant <laughs> Turkish reporter Ardo Cal uh, on the scene, breaking news with CNED. Well, um, anyhow, well, I actually like if, if, in a world where there is no COVID, I would actually say that he'd. I think he'd be the per perfect player for Dignitas or the new ho the homeless now over at Dignitas. Mm -hmm. I think he'd be the perfect mm -hmm. player because Dignitas, uh, you know, they had Lasky. They broke apart because they wanted to have that fifth player operator, primary operator, which you, right now in the game has to be more than not be Jet, especially in North America. So if there was a non-COVID world, I could definitely see Dignitas scooping up CNED, and that would be such a scary, scary team. Like if you brought CNED with Superman and you have depth in, like, that group, that would be a really scary team. Obviously, I don't think that could happen just because of COVID. That, having to get CNET over to yeah. America, having to find a housing yeah. for It's him. a whole can of worms, yeah. definitely. Uh, so, you, know what, you know what name would actually be more appropriate, believe it or not, would be Skadoodle. Uh, definitely based on what everything oh, is happening. He's still, he's still on T1. He's still on T1. He's still on T1. He's still on T1. He's still on T1, Harda. <laughs> there uh, there once was a time where Mr. Hiko very much wanted to build a super team with Skadoodle in Counter-Strike, and it did not work out because Skadoodle got a better opportunity to go to Cloud9. Maybe that opportunity five years later has presented itself in a different game. 
Okay, they so did let's play let's catch together everyone up. at the very beginning of the Ballard scene. Well, well that's why T one outbid Hunter Thieves for him in the free agency market. So yeah. he's this on T one no, still. It all comes full circle. This is no disrespect to Mr. Joe Marsh. Lots of respect for Joe on this program. But the reason we're bringing Skadoodle's name up is because he happens to not be playing on the main lineup for T1 right now. He didn't in the last tournament. Fraud, their coach, subbed in. And it looks like he will not be playing in the foreseeable future, at least mm. with T1, Tyler. So we saw some leaked DMs on Food Stream. We saw some, a little bit of spice. Uh. A little bit that of sugar and spice and everything yeah. nice. Mm -hmm. So let's unpack what is happening right now with T1 and Skadoodle, Emily. What, <sighs> it, it, my first question is, with everything that is happening there, is this even repairable? Would Skadoodle even want to return to a roster like this? So, I mean, the, the DM thing is unfortunate, right? Uh, just because everyone saw it now. <laughs> um, and whenever something like that happens and it's brought to the forefront, um, that it's always bad, right? Like that always, I think that always affects a relationship. Uh, it'd be one thing if it didn't make it out to the public, but if it does, you know, that that's really rough. Uh, the thing I would say is I kept thinking, and Jacob and I were actually talking about this off camera while you guys were doing your interview, while we were watching it. Um, I kept thinking about what Jacob said about this T1 team from the very beginning when, when Scott joined, uh, and it was that we were, or he was concerned again, we're going to go back to the IGL position, um, in that who was going to step up on the team, uh, you know, was it going to be AZK, which it, it did seem like for a while, right? Um, because Ska is more of a, a quiet, uh, individual. And that's not saying his comms are bad. It's just that he's not an IGL, right? Like that, that's. That's all. Um, you know, he he communicates kind of like the minimum amount of information. And from the comms I've listened to him in CS, he's, it's like actually very precise in terms of what he's like saying, but he doesn't speak often. Because um, I actually went back and I like yeah. listened to his comms because I was really curious about this. Uh, and so I kept thinking of what Jacob said in the beginning is that the true test of how this T1 roster is going to come together is whether they can find an IGL, right? And it really doesn't seem like they have been able to find it. And the biggest problem I've seen with this team is certainly not individual talent, but just overall team chemistry. And I think even more so than, you know, like we look at League of Legends rosters uh, specifically and, and these super teams that don't work out. Um, and we're like, okay, it must have been a comms issue because it's not an individual thing. I think even more in like a tactical shooter, like your comms have to be very clean and very concise. And you guys all have to be on, on the same page in terms of like how you want to play. I don't think we've necessarily figured out like the best, the best comms for Valorant or even the best play style. But I do think that one of the main issues with this T1 team referring to like their kind of lack of chemistry overall has been that they still have not seemed to find an in-game leader. And maybe that is me like presuming a lot of things. But again, I couldn't help but return to a lot of what Jacob said and his concerns about this roster when it was first announced. And especially uh, when Ska was announced as the as the yeah. uh, like final edition. Yeah, I mean, I... Uh, Tyler, I, I know that you can talk to about this a little bit, but I know that Nitro was, uh, or T1 was in pursuit of Nitro before he ended up with mm -hmm. Honor Thieves. And like, I actually think that would have been a very good fit if that worked out because Nitro is loud. And, and the big thing about T1 that has struck me, obviously they were really good at the very beginning of tournaments in general because they were like skill wise, those players are as good, if not better, than most people in the North American Bowerit scene. What is bad about them, what seems bad about them, is that they're incredibly indecisive. They cannot seem to make up their mind. And that's why you need someone like Nitro or some whoever they're going to end up picking up in the end to replace Skadoodle. Because they're going to need someone that goes, this is what we are going to do. Who's going to be able to, you know, like IGL is a really hard role. You have to take in the information you're hearing. You have to process it. And you have to make decisions. It is a high pressure role because if something's wrong, it's your fault. It comes back to you if you make the wrong call. But you also have to be very good at taking information in and making decisions based off of that in a very short period of time, right? Like that, uh, that takes a lot of game knowledge. It takes a lot of communication skills. You have to be very assertive too in that regard. And no one on this T1 team's assertive. I, like Braxton and Skadoodle are incredibly quiet people. Food and Crashies are like in incredibly immature, in my opinion, in terms of where they're at right now. And like AZK is also not very vocal either. So to me, like this team had this issue from the beginning. 
in my opinion. Like, not it's not an individual skill problem. It's just that they they like they're in, indecisive, and we saw that when they would face people like Sentinels and TSM, who, to their credit, are you know like Sentinels does some crazy off the wall sh- like off the wall stuff, and that's like, but they're very good at saying, okay, we're gonna do this, or we're gonna do it now, right? Like they're very like push the gas go. Same thing with TSM. TSM's a little bit more calculated than Sentinels in a lot of ways, but like again, like they're on the same page. This team looked very disjointed. Skadoodle, like, I could make the case that a couple of the other other players may need to go too. But yeah, like, I think that if they're gonna replace him, they they need to get him a uh, they need to get an IGL in this team. That is literally the biggest role they need to fill. It comes down to their passiveness, the lack of IGL, and the lack of having a jet main in this meta in North America, especially. I think you can get away with it a bit in Europe, but in North America. Operator is king, and we talked to Hiko about this, where you a lot of these games in North America, a lot of these rounds, if you watch any NA match, really, if it's TSM or Sentinels or Envy, a lot of these matches come down to two Operator players, generally Jet players, peaking each other, 50-50 duel, who's going to get the shot off? Usually it's a 10 to reward to L, which is why they're very, very uh, uh, doing well right now in North America, and they play this aggressive peaking, very confident style. And we see it with Mame, we see it with Tens, we see it with Cortell. Uh, Shazam and Sentinels, I would say, are not more of a operator beholden team, but they still have Shazam, who was quite good at the operator, and he has transitioned to be a pretty dang good jet as well. So when you look at T1, they don't have that jet player. They don't have that player where yep. they can have him peak against a Wardell, or they can make sure that in a battle with Wardell or Tens or Shazam or Mame, that they could win. And it's the reason why Homeless parred ways of Lasky because they need that player. The reason why Immortals parred ways of Pure Lulu is because they need that player in Dicey's. And with T1, I think in their mind, it was, we want to get Nitro. Nitro has shown that he can play Jet. He can operate as well. Put him on the team. Max him up with Brax, who's going onto the Cypher, which I think fits him perfectly. I think he's best on agents like Omen and yep. Cypher, where he can lurk use that cerebral mind of his. And I think him and Brax would have been such a scary duo, but because that fell through, 100 Thieves threw in the golden bag, gave him the creative freedom of building out his own team, he went over to 100 Thieves. And now it's going to be him and uh, him and Hiko making a team, while T1 is in this very awkward position where I think Scott, Scott's radiant. He's playing Jet. He was just playing Jet with Shroud, playing really well on the Jet. It's not like he can't play the agent. But even if you put him back into the lineup, that still lacks that IGL, right? So I don't think Scott is just easily like, that guy has to leave, right? Obviously, it's awkward because of the, the leaked TMs. He was going to be benched for Nitro if they signed him. But I don't necessarily think he is the odd man out, right? I do think he can salvage getting back into the good graces of the team. I think him, ACK, and Brack still have a really good relationship, I would hope. Uh, so it might not be Scott that leaves. I, I'm not, this is no from no sources, this is me guessing, but they spent a lot of money to get Scott. I do believe they really believe in the guy. He is grinding the game hard. He's not quitting the game. He's not just throwing away, saying, oh, I got benched, I quit. I think he's grinding, and, it, and there might be a situation where Scott stays and they fund IGL and they police replace someone else on the roster. I think the big question is, does he need to Does he need to stay, and does he need to keep playing pro, right? Like, he, Skadoodle yeah. is a very successful streamer before he did this, he easily could go back to being a successful streamer. We've talked about the lack of pre-shroud, at least, the lack of uh, Valorant streaming talent on Twitch, right? Like, people who are really good at stream. Skadoodle is a good st- streamer, like, to his credit, right? Like that, And that's what he did after he stopped playing CS professionally. So, like, he signed to Loaded, the same people that rep Shroud and rep Ninja and Courage and all these big streamers, like... You could just go get endorsement deals and make like significant money being one of the top Valorant streamers or Counter Strike or whatever the hell he wants to play, right? Like, I don't think he necessarily needs to be on a pro team if he doesn't want to. I'm not saying that that's gonna worry how he's gonna end up, but yeah, like it it if that's like if he doesn't want to deal with this again and had to deal with another another like situation where he's odd man out, like yeah, he could just literally just call it and and go play, go uh, stream and make a lot of money. Let's rapid fire the uh, next news item because, I mean, this is as low of a news item as you can get because this is probably oh, like, I, yeah. you're going to hear this chat and you're going to be like, wait, that's oh. news? Yeah. <laughs> Guess what, folks? Brace yourself. Hold on to your hats. Vice 
has signed with Cloud9. Pause for dramatic event. Pause for dramatic effect. Why did this take so long? Serious question. Just time, that's it? Look at 100 Thieves. Look what literally just happened with 100 Thieves and the arranged marriage that happened there. They took a gamble, 100 Thieves, because they wanted to be a full roster for the first edition series tournament, and it didn't work out. C9 were like, hey, let's take this as slow as humanly possible. Sure, they could have probably signed Vice alongside Shinobi or uh, uh, Ruckles, but it looked like they were about to actually you know, pick up the full roster. But yeah, it's fine. Like, take your time. And it also gives a bit of shine for everyone, right? Like, Vice now gets to have a little bit of shine. Be like, oh, hey, guys, I'm the fifth member. Like, this is my announcement. Like, it it's fine. Like, this is not a big surprise. Uh, I'm... We can discuss all day if this roster is good enough to win a championship. I know there's been so many, you know, debates about can they win a championship with, you know, Vice and Shinobi's kills? Uh, do they, are they, can they frag enough to win a championship? Are they too reliant on tens? Do they have a consistent number two that can back up tens when they need them the most? It, it's it's a long discussion. I think this team is really, they're good. They are, they're, they're, they can be very good at times. I still haven't seen them as amazing i haven't seen them hit the levels of sentinels or tsm or even gen g but they have potential and i think shinobi is their in-game leader and i think hopefully now that they're all signed we're gonna have the last edition series event and then maybe a bit of a break while we go through the world championship in league of legends so I, i'm i'm giving them time i think this team has any team that has tens on it i think they can make a final he is so dang good he's the magician of valorant he can pull a rabbit out of his hat any other round, any single round. And until they nerf Jets ult, Tens can win a round by himself in an eco round, almost guaranteed every game. So I still think C9 is going to be a, a danger in any tournament they play him because he's one of the few players that can stand up to Wardell's opping. But it, yeah, not not a you know super exciting surprise. It's not, oh, hey, c Stewie 2K is their fifth member. It's vice, but sometimes the, easy, the, the most straightforward option is the best option. Jacob, let me start with you on this one. Cloud9 also, in more surprising news, announced a Korean Valorant roster. Now, this is not the first time that we've heard a major organization do this. In fact, T1 is operating with three teams. And in other regions, teams like Team Liquid are thinking of having multiple teams in multiple regions as well. But specifically, Cloud9 announcing a Korean roster. Does that surprise you at all? I think so. I think that a lot... I've actually had a lot of discussions about this, about... Uh, and I, I I did a panel for the Inman Global Esports Conference a few a uh, few months ago with Joe Marsh, the the CEO of T1, about how Western teams are trying to get involved in Asian countries like China and South Korea. I think that we're going to see that more generally across all of esports business. That runs an open system, right? Like there's no anti sister team rules at this point. I'm sure those will come, especially when we start getting international competition, because Riot will be concerned about. Match fixing and everything else, competitive integrity, et cetera. But I think for the time being, like if you want to establish your if you want to establish like your brand in another country, it, the easiest way to do that is to sign a team. And especially if they end up being successful. Korea also feels like a very open market right now because of all the Vanguard issues we've talked about. Valorant really hasn't cemented itself in Korean esports culture quite yet because of some of those issues, because you can't play them in every single PC bong because there's security concerns, right? kernel level thing everything else uh, around that but yeah like I, this doesn't surprise me at all i think that a lot of teams are going to try to find ways to get uh get their their uh brands into those countries and make a big impact in china and south korea and and yeah so c9 is just joins that list right yeah i think it's a branding thing more than anything else uh and also like if you if we do eventually, like the the pro, like the pros of having a sister team are, you get to in this kind of style, you get to market yourself in a in a different country um, with a bunch of players from that country. Um, the only like con is again, they probably won't allow sister teams once we have international competition. Um, and the other con is like sometimes if you have a sister team, one of the cool benefits of it is that you get to scrim each other. Um, which is unfortunately something that also can't happen in a in a COVID world right now. But I know like that was actually what was behind the rise of the sister team system in South Korea to begin with in League of Legends was that the whole idea was that you had two teams that could scrim each other internally um, and and prepare a variety of strategies against each other before also playing against 
um, other teams in, in a tournament. So um, that unfortunately will not be a benefit either. Um, but I don't, I mean, I don't mind it. I think to Jacob's point, Korea is really open. Um, I know we, uh, they had their kind of first tournament this past week uh, and, you know, Vision Strikers, which is the uh, the former MVP lineup mm. um, one, which I, I honestly don't think should be much of a surprise to people because these guys have been like they they made the swap over to Valorant really early um, from from CS. So that shouldn't be a surprise across the tournament. We saw a lot of former um, PUBG players. We saw some former Overwatch players, the team that beat uh First of all, I want to shout out the team that beat T1's uh, Korean roster. Was named first of all, they were named Back Kimchi, which is just awesome. But then second of all, it was um, uh, it was the uh, the Tyrong team with Climax on it, um, who people might know from Overwatch, from uh, the O2 teams. Um, and and Tyrong used to be a coach uh, in the Overwatch League as well. So I just wanted to shout out to them because sick name. Uh, and also, they were the team that ended up beating T1. So we're yeah. we're not going to talk about this right now because this is a totally different esport. But speaking of C9, uh, shout out to FlyQuest for making worlds and <laughs> beating C9 in beat the C9. LCS playoffs. Well, they oh my gosh. Gosh. invest more into Valorant. They, this is a sign that they just need to invest way more into Valorant. Just just yes. cut your losses. FlyQuest started <laughs> Valorant yeah. team. Keep uh, pressing your luck. No, C9 needs to continue focus to invest. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, 100 Thieves are like, okay, our Legion's, our Legion's team isn't good. We'll, we'll just buy Nitro. We'll buy $300,000 plus, possibly, with Nitro. Try to make a super <laughs> team there. Now C9's like, all right, maybe Vice wasn't the option. Maybe we should go buy Stewie 2K from Team Liquid. Maybe we should go do that because. But no, uh, congrats to congrats to FlyQuest. What a yeah. victory for them. Also, I apologize to Juke Sidewalker in chat because I totally just spoiled it because he was saving game four. Oh, so no. I'm oh, horrible. Arna. How no. dare you? I I owe wow. you, Juke. I, I apologize. That's, that's terrible. That that feels that's a feels bad man moment. Uh, speaking of feels bad man moments, I got a little mm -hmm. bit of Valorant trivia for you. This is going to be a really tough question. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is oh, from boy. the recent patch notes. From the oh. recent patch notes. Pardon me. Please identify the agent you believe mm. this nerf was inspired by. Uh -huh. Just wait, wait for the whole question before you answer. All shotguns have had their accuracy reduced. Wait. Mm. When mm. being fired in the air. Mm. Killjoy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Jacob. Jacob has Jacob has his hand in the air. I think we all know the answer. <laughs> Omen, <laughs> Phoenix. No, nothing like getting uh, buckied in the face by a jet who flies down on your face. Just yeah. make you throw things at your monitor, or maybe that's just me. I like this nerf though. Oh, no, it's good. It's good. Jet needs one. Jet needs one nerf. I think what, uh, what right now this is not. I mean, it's a good nerf, but until as long as she can still uh, dash in a, a direction to leap after getting an off shot off, she is going to remain to be the primary operator agent in the game until that's taken away. I don't know. If that is a thing that Riot really wants. I think Riot likes having Jet in games because Jet makes for exciting gameplay. Like, she is the Yasuo character. She is that character that makes really crazy highlights. And one of the reasons why Wardell went from a 100-view streamer to 11,000-view streamer, because he played tons of Jet, and he plays a lot of aggressive, you know, highlight real play. So if you're Riot, you would much rather have your primary operator player be a Jet than a Cypher, right? You would much rather have Jet be in the in the uh, the meta than have it be Killjoy, Sage, Sova, Cypher, a full, you know, utility defensive composition. So I do think she gets, still need to get some nerfs. So she's not a hundred percent pick when it comes to primary operator status in North America. But I think this is a good change. I still think that they need to nerf her ult a bit. So it's not always like this free eco round that, you know, attends can just steal over and over and over, but it's a good start. I think ulting her nerf probably would make her a bit, Worse, but I, I don't know. I don't know if they really want her out of the meta because she's a fun agent to watch competitively. She makes good fun plays. 
Yeah, I, I, I th we talked about this a lot, by the way. If you happen to catch our interview with Hiko and Nitro, we talked about Jet a lot as an agent mm -hmm. and what needs to be mm -hmm. nerfed, etc. Particularly the alt that's going to be available on YouTube. Uh, let me go back to roster news really quickly. Uh, there was obviously one big piece of roster news that we did not get to, and that is the one that, and that's probably because we talked about it so much on last week's show, guessing about colors. And guess what? We were right. Oh, what wow. a shock. Oh, what wow. Huge news. Wow. GG's Tyler. Wow. GG's Tyler. Well done. I, I did it. I got it. It was, I'm such as, I scooped the big one. Nitro was no big deal. <laughs> this was the big, this was. So Dignitas uh, have entered professional Valorant and mm. they have signed not all of them, but the core of the homeless roster. Uh, so there are some holes here. Uh, there is a fifth player mm -hmm. that is missing from this roster, which means Lasky is not one of the players that was signed here from the homeless roster. But Depth, Psalm, Superman, and Poised did make the cut, and now they will be wearing black and gold. Emily, what do you make of uh, just homeless as a roster, how they've been performing in tournaments, but also the fact that Lasky is not part of Dignitas? Um, I mean, Tyler pointed it out earlier, right? Like they they need to find uh, uh, a player that fits in with the rest of the four as as more of like a a primary like entry opper kind of. Um, and I mean, I really like this team. Like since they made their kind of faux dark horse run, uh, like their initial one, I believe is in the space. Invitational, if I'm not mistaken. Every every single any tournament starting to blur together. I think that was where. Uh, I think that was their thing, if I remember correctly. Um, but no, I mean, I'm I'm happy these guys got picked up. I know Sam was having, uh, like he's been, uh, from what I know, shopping the team around for a while. Um, I know he initially came up against the whole like, oh, Fortnite players don't have hands uh, narrative. Um, so it's happy to see that dispelled as well. Um, and I mean, I wish nothing for the best for these guys. I'm just wondering, my main thing is I want to ask you all, cause I haven't heard anything. Do you know who's on the short list to replace Lasky? Uh, I know that I believe Wardell brought it up today that Shanks, who is a former Counter-Strike player in MDL, uh, who is a jet main has been trialed. They were talking about how he could possibly be the player. I'm sure they're trying out, uh, numerous players. I know days has been tried out by a few teams recently. Mm -hmm. Somebody it, I'm looking forward to where he lands. Yeah, there's. I think there's a lot of good jet players in North America who can op and who are one trick jet players for, to an extent. But I also think it's very worrisome, right? Where you have to know that this player isn't just good on jet. You need a yeah. good primary operator overall because jet might get nerfed in a week or two. There is definite cause and reason why they might just nerf her a bit, and she's not 100 percent pick right now. She is at you have to have a jet on your team in North America to win, but that in a month or two, that might not be the case. So don't, for, for these teams, they have to look at a player who's not only good at jet, but also just a very solid primary operator all around. So uh, Shanks might be it. Uh, we might see another type of player, but there, there's a lot of players that, that could be the fifth man of it. To tell me if this person is a uh, jet opper, but Roka is in the chat a lot right now. That mm -hmm. name is popping up a lot. Uh, it, it, he has the aim. About, he, he definitely I mean, has he, the aim. He's yeah, we've aim. talked about him before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is, we talked about him last week. Is, is, uh, is the Jet Opera, like we've talked about that role a lot and how many teams are looking for that role, assuming that all things stay the same. Of course, like you said, Tyler, Jet could be nerfed tomorrow. We don't know. But right now, as we stand, it sounds like that is by far the most lucrative position. If you are a free agent mm -hmm. and you are good at jet op, it seems like you would be in very high demand and your time would be right now to reach out to orgs, especially ones looking for you, and 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 sign a big deal. Yeah, definitely. Because you can't win right now versus Wardell or Tens or Shazam or Mame in any of these tournaments if you don't have a jet. Because a lot of these matches, like Hiko said, there's not enough utility to make sure you're going to have a, a good time versus an operator if you don't have one on your side. So for these teams, you need one to survive and to win. You can survive without a, a Sage player. You can survive somewhat without a Cypher player, especially if Killjoy now in the meta. But for teams right now in North America, especially, you need the Jet Operator player. Yeah. Let's, 
Let's go through uh, some of the uh, tournaments that we saw this past weekend. We had Pittsburgh Knights allied esports odyssey, two tournaments happening across the pond with different results, of course, uh, but similar structure. Uh, we talked about this on Tyler's show on Monday, the power rankings show, uh, which happens every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern right here on the Twitch channel where you get a fresh set of power rankings every week between NA or EU, depending on the week. But man, did FaZe Clan ever set the tone for how a tournament should be? At least oh, a major FaZe one. Clan. Yeah. yeah. Chef's kiss. Right? Chef's kiss. Like these, I, I just like, Tyler made the best point, I thought, uh, on the show, Jacob, that like the group stage for Allied Esports Odyssey was great. It was good. I liked it. I, I, it was fun to watch. It was spread out nicely. But these best of ones, I know that we talk about that in esports all the time. Not only <laughs> did they, do they happen on the same day, but it's especially Valorant, though. Especially you get one map to play on, right? And you lose a coin toss, you're in a disadvantage. And you're going to play on a map that you are 20% win rate on. And you're starting on attack. Like, there's so many variables that make it even more of a feels bad man moment. You know, Jacob? It's just, it, 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 it's best of one does not suit Valorant at all. I think that's like part of the reason the Ignition Series events are happening as they are right now anyway, in the sense that Riot wants to see what the community likes and what the players like, and then before they start doing their own first-party tournaments, the phase event definitely stands out as like, I think the audience liked it, I think the players liked it. One format we haven't seen is like the Swiss format, which has happened mm -hmm. in a few different Counter-Strike uh, tournaments before. I think it works fairly well because... Like uh, like Valorant, you have in Counter Strike, you have map uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, so I think it's really important. Uh, I think it's really important to try that format at some point too, because it kind of balances that out in some case. Although it takes ever to get through a Swiss tournament. Um, nonetheless, yeah, I mean, like I was a little underwhelmed by both of these events compared to how I felt about some of the others of the past. Um, I thought the Allied event was the better of the two, in my opinion. Like, the, the Knights event was all right. Um, but nonetheless, like, it is what it is. Like, I, I'm looking forward to the Pop Flash tournament uh, more in particular because I think that we're going to, to our point from last week, Emily and I's point last week, that we're going to see a lot more, like, hype content around it because that mm -hmm. that's what B-Side did really well with Flashpoint. Even though the games were awful for uh, Flashpoint, the the majority of the games were awful for Flashpoint. Um uh that you know that's the content's good um and i also think that they're gonna do a good job at storytelling uh notably too because mr monte cristo who is the uh the vp of brand over at um vp of brand over at b-site uh he is a former overwatch league caster and some of the players participating in that event are overwatch league folk um so he knows that story really well and then also uh, the other part of that is that a lot of these guys, last Counter-Strike tournament, Ordell, etc., uh, was Flashpoint. That was the last thing they played before they transitioned over to Valorant. So they had plenty of footage to uh, to cycle through and tell the story of these guys coming from Overwatch and uh, CS. So I'm excited about that. Like, But yeah, I was a little let down by the Knights, Knights event. Uh, I think it. I wasn't surprised by the results at all, other than T1 being eliminated in group stage. But uh, yeah, overall, it, it, it was a, a weekend of Valorant. Nothing, nothing too shocking for me. I mean, I think the by nature of like narrative, I think the and maybe it's just because again I log on as like the EU defender here. Um, I think the Allied tournament was more interesting because we all wanted to see how this FPX lineup was going to perform, right? Like if they had come out of the gates and somehow just like absolutely obliterated G two, that would have been an ins kind of an insane story. Um, even with all of the the like off off stage issues with David P, which again like condolences that's an awful thing to have to go through in the mid tournament um but what we did end up seeing was that fpx are looking like uh you know a pretty good team at about the same level as uh as team liquid uh who they narrowly beat uh in the losers bracket after narrowly mm -hmm. losing to g2 um and i think like those are the two teams that we're going to be looking at to see going forward how they evolve Team Liquid with the this like former Fish One Two Three lineup uh, and how they're really starting, in my opinion, to find their stride and how they want to play. Um, so I feel like it's still like only upward from here in terms of them continuing to improve. I think we've seen like incremental improvements from them uh, over the past few tournaments. 
Um, and then FPX, which again, this is their first tournament, and I think they performed like pretty well. Like I wasn't expecting them to to come out and obliterate G two. Um, and I think anyone who was expecting that had very significantly and overly high expectations. Um, but I think we saw like flashes of what this roster should be able to do with this talent, right? And it's all about again, like you know, finding a stronger team chemistry and synergy, and also uh, unfortunately playing in a in an event that isn't best of ones when you get to the bracket stage, which was unfortunate. Uh, but again, I'm always going to harp on the fact that I hate best of ones just generally on principle. I really like, I just like uh, Tyler and just thinking about the power ranking mm. show, like we, we, we only differed in the top five in one, in one instance, two and three, yeah. right. You had uh team liquid at two. I had FPX at two. Like it was really interchangeable for me. It was like, it basically depending on what day you put the list together for me anyway. Mm. But I wonder, like, it's unfortunate that a best of one playoff, if it continues, right. will determine how we think about future power rankings, mm. right? Like, it's, I don't know, I, I, I'm just very, especially with Val Valorant, like I said, it's very disappointing that, uh, that, that, that this exists. But the results were not very disappointing, especially for G2 uh, in the Allied Odyssey. Mm. Uh, FPX had a great showing, like you said, Emily. Team Liquid also had a good showing. I feel like there was definitely a gap. There's two gaps now in Europe right now. There's the gap between G2 and the rest of the pack. And then there's a second gap between the top three teams being G2, Team Liquid, and FPX, and the rest of Europe again. I think it's, NIP has a little bit of a, an argument to be included. In they the lost to both of them. I mean, in, in a, a best, a, of, in one. A best of one. In a best of one. I think, yeah, I think I, NIP's consistency has shown that they should be... If not, let's. I think it, we need a few more tournaments of the top three placing in the top three to say there is a big three. I think NIP, especially with Lucker, who is one of the best Jet players in Europe right now, one of the few players who can really take over a game on Jet in Europe. I think it's we can't dismiss them, even though we've, we've kind of, they were quite overlooked at times. They're not the sexiest team, but I do think they should be included in that foursome until those three can pull away. I do agree with you that those three are probably the best three in Europe and should be for a, quite a while, but they need to actually prove it in more ignition series events, which we do have coming up. So, any uh, what what other major takeaways from both tournaments? Either the Pittsburgh Knights Invitational, I think C nine uh, showing improvement was good. I think that them getting a, th a third place finish was a, a big confidence booster, if nothing else, for them. I think that they they really wanted a solid placement. I mean, I'm sure they would have wanted first. Everyone does, but that's a good placement for them, at least for now, now that they have a full roster officially signed. But otherwise, any other, any other big takeaways from either of the tournaments? I miss Sentinels. A tournament, an NA tournament without Sentinels is not a NA tournament that can fully be considered a, a, a grand event. I think, obviously, TSM versus Sentinels is the hottest feud currently going on in the whole world of Valorant. Mm. And I think Pop Flash, we have Pop Flash is going to be arguably the eight best teams in North America. FaZe might be in there over Homeless, who now we're dig. But I do think those are the top eight teams I currently have in my NA Valorant Power Rankings, one through eight. So I'm excited for Pop Flash. Pop Flash has all the potential if it is produced right, if, it's, if the casters are on, because there's a lot of new casters at the event. It has mm -hmm. a, a lot of production value behind it that we haven't seen from other events. It has the potential to be the best Valorant term we've seen thus far. There's the potential there. Phase Clan was awesome. A lot of that was down to the observing, to the games themselves, the rivalry between TSM and Sentinels. But I think the eight teams, the the longer format, the double elimination, the best of series, we have a really good... We, there's a lot of good setup with Pop Flash, where... Every all the ingredients are right. Now we just have to make it and, and put it in the oven, and hopefully when it comes out, everything is perfect. Because if it is, we're we're in we're in we're in uh we're gonna get a banger. It's gonna we we are in a banger mood with Pop Flash. So I'm very excited for it. I mean, this very well this very well this next week may very well be the last ignition series we events yep. we get for for mm -hmm. the, the next couple of months, right? Like Pop Flash and and level uh, level two will could be the very end of this for us. in the main so, regions yeah i know oceana yeah. still has the rise of valor tournament but for the main like europe and na like 
yeah, this might be the final ones for quite a while as, you know, Riot turns their attention towards League of Legends for Worlds. I mean, that concerns me more about Europe than it concerns me about North America, mm. because, like, we still haven't seen big organizations pop, pop or, like, come into the space. So I'm, like, I'm questioning what that looks like. After a level cost two, like, what does European Valorant look like? How does it remain relevant? What do these players do in that period of time, right? Because... A lot of the guys in the North American teams are streamers, right? Like they, that's, that's like it's pro playing and streaming go hand in hand with one another. That's not the case in, in Europe, especially if you look at teams like FPX, like they don't stream English language. They occasionally stream, uh, in their, in their native tongue. But yeah, like to me, like what happens to European Valorant with a like two months break of time off? Like that's, that's a long time. And it has me very concerned, um, about what will happen to the scene. I do think, though, that one thing like I want to mention really briefly, and I'm sure we can talk about this next week, too, uh, while we're in the midst of these turns, or in the midst of Pop Flash and right before uh, Level Clash 2, I think when we come out of the two-month break, there are going to be a lot of players you've never heard of mm. who are top of the leaderboard, and they are going to be prospects. because they're, uh, And I think that they're going to be scouted throughout this by certain teams that are looking to get in. You already see a little bit of this happening with lesser-known players, but like the majority of people still getting signed right now in Valorant in both regions are XTS pros and X pros from another game. Fortnite, Overwatch, whatever it may be, right? I think for the first time after this short little break that we've been hearing about, I think you're going to come back and see people who have never played anything professionally before they played Valorant. And that, and that's mm -hmm. what I feel like. I am excited about that. Um, but I am worried about the European scene in particular, given that the financial stability is not there uh, unless you are winning tournaments. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be a full two-month break. I do think there will be third-party tournaments. But sure. I, from what I know, it's not going to be having these big grand events during those two months. Which in NA, I'm sure there's going to be more tournaments. There's the Pulse Invitational, maybe in September. There's so many sponsorships and so many organizers who want to put on Valor events in NA. I think we're going to still see a steady, uh, a steady, you know, a uh, slew of tournaments every weekend, maybe every other weekend during you know Worlds for League of Legends. But to Jacob's point, what scene, what, what tournament organizers in Europe are going to step up when Riot's not there, right? Who's going to be that kind of beacon to kind of hold the scene together and have those big tournaments to keep it going until Riot comes back with whatever they're doing next, with a new Ignition Series tournament, or maybe, you know, a they'll give us plans for what their World Championship could look like. Because I, I wouldn't be surprised if they come out and say, hey, we're going to have a World Championship next summer. And this is our game plan, and we're going to have, you know, online tournaments gearing up to that. Mm -hmm. Like, that's all all on the table. But I, I do agree that NA's future looks good. There's so much sponsorship. It, viewership's good. Uh, I, I think, obviously, this game being more family-friendly than Counter-Strike makes it so much easier for North American orcs to get sponsorships around Valorant. Where in Europe, it doesn't really matter. Where Europe is still very much Counter-Strike in you can tell by just looking at yeah. simple Google's trend surge is where NA loves Valorant. They Google Valorant more than CS. Then you look at Russia and Ukraine. Never, nothing Googling of Valorant. They don't look at Valorant at all. And it's 99%. A, a slight to Shao. How dare they? Yeah. I mean, Shao's very good, but there's yeah. the viewership in, in CIS and Russia isn't there yet. They are, um, that is a Valve territory, the CIS. Let, Last point to you, Emily, uh, and if you'd like to preview the uh, Pop Flash tournament as well and give your thoughts going into it, uh, floor is yours. Um, I'm going to say what I want to see, and you kind of saw their like improvement uh, during the Pittsburgh Knights thing, is that I want to see, and like you know how I'm like, oh man, Envy is going to have their breakout tournament, right? It's not going to be uh, this one, but it's going to be the next one. Like, this is a tournament where I really want to see Envy come out and make a statement. And yeah. that's what I really want out of out of this event. Like, yes, I know there's TSM Sentinels rivalry um, and Genji has per like, performed really well during the Pittsburgh Knights event. But in this event, where we have a larger, like, like fewer teams, but a larger bracket, double elimination, like, I want to see uh envy like i i like want this to be their their breakout like their statement event uh cementing them as one of the top teams in na so that's a that's what i would like to see out of this tournament like i'm not necessarily calling it but i feel like their time is soon yeah this is a team that that ages like a fine wine i'm excited <laughs> to watch them I, i'm excited to watch more of them play 
because um, they remind me a little bit of TSM in yep. terms of like they can get better. Um, they have veteran leadership. They have some younger players who who did not get their chance necessarily in the other games uh, that they came from. So that like Envy makes me excited. It's one of those teams that I look at like like mm-hmm. Genji, like Immortals, also uh, earlier before they started winning or placing top threes at events. Uh, I was very excited about those teams because I thought they they could develop over time. Envy feels like that, and I agree with Emily. I think it's coming soon. Well, you can get excited for Pop Flash. Yes, August 25th, $50,000 prize pool. It will be a seven-day affair from the 25th to the 31st. Eight teams, Group A is Cloud9, TSM, Gen G, and Dignitas. Dignitas, Dignitas. Group B is T1 Sentinels. Back at it again. Envy, as just mentioned, and Immortals. That's going to be a great one. We can't wait to cover it on the next edition of the ESPN Esports Valorant Show every Thursday, 8 p.m. Eastern. Don't forget, Tyler, Power Ranking Show every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Give us a little bit of a preview, Tyler. What's coming up? This week is going to be special. We're still figuring out what the dynamics of it are. Are we going to rank top players, top you know, top plays? Ooh. We're going to do a debate on Ooh. NA versus Europe. Are we going to do a draft? Uh, who knows? It, there is no NA tournament this weekend, so we can't do an NA power ranking until the weekend after with Paw Flash. So we're going to do a special episode, maybe a draft. I think, uh, Arda, would you be down for another draft? Get, I'm, get I'm always by? down. Oh. I'm always down. You oh, know you, that. I mean, I have Magnus I, Carlson I in my the, back pocket. I have, I, am, I have Magnus. Yeah, I am happily the in case of emergency break glass uh, guest. Always happy to. Um, but I encourage you all to, speaking of guests, Watch our interview with Hiko and Nitro mm-hmm. if, in case you missed it. It's going to be uh, posted. Uh, Daniel J. Collette, our producer, will be posting it soon after the conclusion of the show on YouTube slash ESPN Esports. But that's it. That's all for us here. Thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next week.